Big growth means big projects here in the Inland Northwest. And Crim 2 News is committed to digging deeper and giving you more information as part of our Boomtown series. In this next half hour, we have an inside look at the building boom in our area. We're on the ground as the new downtown Spokane Stadium starts to take shape and hitting the roads to show you what is being done to ease growing gridlock. Plus, from housing to schools to libraries, big changes are underway to better serve the booming population. This is Boomtown's major projects of the Inland Northwest. As our area grows, it seems many of the construction projects are getting bigger as well. Thanks for joining us for this Krem 2 News Boomtown Special. I'm Tim Pham. And I'm Channing Curtis. One of the most watched projects is the new downtown Spokane Stadium, where construction is expected to wrap up in the next year. Nicole Hernandez got an inside look at the project and what it will bring to the city. This may not look like much more than a dirt lot. And what you're looking at is the base work for the stadium. But this is groundwork for the new Spokane Public Schools downtown stadium. This is the home stadium for Spokane Public Schools. It will be home for all five Spokane Public Schools high schools. This is where their home events will be played, whether it be soccer or football. SPS designed it with students in mind. We all know the more people we have in the stands, the more excitement that generates and the more energy. And really, we want that energy for our high school athletes. The new stadium will hold 5,000 people. Plus, it's within walking distance to some high schools and right on the bus route for others. The goal is to create a fuller, more energized environment. One of the things that was important to our school board was that we create a better access for all of our students, our lower income, our higher income. That access and the hometown energy were both missing from Joe Albee Stadium. And this new stadium will host more than just high school sports. Once built, SPS will hand over promotions and scheduling to the Public Facilities District. The reason that's important is because they're professionals. That's what they do. And we want this stadium to be an asset for the district and the city. Handing off management will save SPS over $21 million. Plus, it will make planning for downtown events like concerts, street fairs, or professional sports easier. They're in charge of scheduling all three venues. And so we'll know when there's a conflict or when there's a challenge, and we'll be able to communicate that to the people that are coming to the events. One of the biggest construction efforts in Spokane isn't one huge project, but rather a push to jumpstart more multifamily housing all across the city. Janelle Finch breaks down what the city has in mind and their search for developers. City leaders have deemed our housing supply an emergency crisis. Housing is an issue that really affects everybody. Somebody has a child, a brother, a sister, a parent who is concerned about their housing situation. Through this council approved ordinance, city planners have created the Building Opportunity and Choices for All pilot program. As we were working through a lot of the code problems that we knew builders were running into, we discovered that our regular process was uh, just too slow. The city hosted an open house for people wanting to learn more about the housing program. In the audience were realtors, architects, and prospective property owners. When considering the project's one-year timeline, some raised an eyebrow to the possibility of seeing actual builds within the year. At the architecture firm that I work at, almost every project we work on has, was in the works for at least two years, sometimes five years. Some of them have been in the works for over 10 years. And so to get something turned around in a year is pretty tricky. That's, that's a tall order. And so everyone that was sitting there kind of spoke to that. They're like, hey, how is this going to work? Is there going to be streamlined? Uh, approval processes to, to help get a bigger window. But still, property builders commend the city for creating a better future for Spokane's housing supply. This has been a long time coming. I think all the developers are going to agree with that. Gardner says over the next year, there might not be a lot of shovels going into the ground. But one of the goals of the program is to lay down the foundation towards more permanent housing codes that include multifamily options. At the end of the one year period in July of 2023, we will have done the necessary work through community outreach, through talking with builders, through going through the process that's set out in city code to then make those permanent changes. For now, the ordinance and program are set to expire at the end of next July, but Garner says there's potential to extend the program an additional year. 
When we talk about mega projects in our region, it doesn't get any bigger than the North Spokane corridor. Talks for the freeway began as early as the 1940s, and while construction is underway right now, WashDOT says it might be another six years before they wrap up work. Here's a look at the work being done right now. Right now, we're driving the completed five and a half mile stretch of the North Spokane corridor. That's the red, black, and parts of the blue portions of the freeway. By summer of 2023, WashDOT hopes to open up the rest of the blue section down to Wellesley, which will open up about seven and a half miles drivers can use. So what's under construction right now? Here's a look at the project map. The blue portion is in progress right now. When it's complete, it will stop on the north side of the Spokane River. A look from the CREM2 drone shows one of the more complicated sections of the project, the Spokane River crossing to the south side of the river at Spokane Community College. This is a look at renderings from WashDOT. These are not finalized, but it does give you an idea of how the pieces will connect over the river. What is missing is the link between them. Uh, that is the iconic Spokane River crossing, and it will go on advertisement in the fall of 2023. Robert Blaken is the assistant regional manager for one of the state's largest transportation projects. We asked him how the pandemic impacted construction. Well, challenges have been abundant all the way back to the, uh, the statewide shutdown of construction projects two years ago when the pandemic uh, initially hit its uh, hit its stride. The next three projects are south of SCC. This is the green and orange sections of the project map. This is set to begin by 2024, and when it's done, the freeway will bring us to Sprague Avenue. Then the final phase is the yellow from Sprague all the way to I-90. Where you can flow at uh, relatively high speeds from the corridor uh, onto dedicated lanes and merge onto the interstate uh, without interruption. So that's it. That's where the freeway will go and when we can expect to see the next phases. As for what it will look like, those renderings are still in the design phases. Here at CREM2 News, we are committed to covering the growth in our area with our Boomtown series. Another mega road project is underway in Post Falls, where the interchange of I-90 and Highway 41 is getting a major makeover. Amanda Rowley shows us what the finished project will look like. You can expect a lot of changes to this area over the next three years. First, the Idaho Transportation Department says this interchange in Post Falls on Celtis is shifting just north of I-90. Traffic will then be controlled by a single signal at the center of the interchange. IDT says the project will improve safety, increase capacity, and provide better connectivity to State Highway 41. Now, since the interchange is shifting north, the current signal at Ross Point Road and Celtis will be removed and replaced with a stop sign. Highway 41 will also be shifted west to connect at Celtis and Herborn Place instead of Ross Point Road. The redesign also lengthens the I-90 westbound off-ramp so that it will no longer curve. The interchange work comes as the population in North Idaho is booming. Nathan Hun shows us how the road changes could impact growth in the area. The groundbreaking for the new I-90 and Highway 41 interchange kicked off a three-year construction project. It is starting one year ahead of schedule. Governor Brad Little of Idaho hopes this new project improves safety and area growth. The traffic backed up here, you know, certain times a day. You never want to have an interstate backed up, so that was one of the reasons from safety. But it's also time, and just the, the growth that's from here to Rathdrum to Coeur d'Alene, the whole area out here, there's just a lot of growth. The Post Falls interchange is getting shifted from Celtis to just north of I-90. It will give easier access into Rathdrum, a small Idaho community already feeling growing pains. It's such an important uh, part of the community is uh, expanding all the 41 and um, making it available for all the residents that's moved in in the last year. So I think it's going to be a great thing. Rathdrum business owners are hopeful that the new interchange will bring more people. Josh Loken, the owner of Westwood Brewery, can't wait to see for himself. I think it'll be great for business. You know, a little more accessible. You know, I mean, sometimes you see traffic backed up on a highway. You might take a left and go eat somewhere else. If traffic's running smooth and it's easy, then, you know, more people might come this way. 
The construction is estimated to take about three years. People are excited for the interchange, but not looking forward to its development. Finding other ways to get from point A to point B, I'm sure it'll impact traffic in that time period. It's inevitable, but you, you can't please everybody. It's, you just have to do the best that we can. The interchange is just one project expected along I-90 in North Idaho in the coming years. With traffic steadily increasing, the state is looking at options to keep everyone moving. Krem 2's Kyle Simchuk shows us why it might not be as easy as adding a third lane to the interstate. Since it was constructed in the 1960s, Interstate 90 hasn't changed much between the Washington State Line and Coeur d'Alene. Two lanes going east and west, 60,000 cars, trucks and semis every day. What has changed is the number of people living here. In less than 30 years, the traffic volume is expected to double. We really need to look at all the options. Brian Rogers knows a thing or two about traffic. I lived in New Jersey. We had a lot of traffic in New Jersey. He's concerned with an idea that's getting some traction, adding a third lane to I-90 in both directions. So right now we need to identify what the needs are, how we can address them, and then what's the cost of addressing them. The Idaho Transportation Department is collecting data for a widening study using radar and drills to see if the soil can support a third lane and what on-ramps and interchanges can be improved. Another thing engineers have to consider are all the bridges and overpasses. The thought of expanding I-90 has not made much progress in the past because of funding issues. Because when you're replacing bridges, you're adding a lot of dollars. It's a lot easier to add a lane sometimes than it is to fund replacement of a bunch of bridges. The improvements could cost anywhere from 600 to $775 million. Funding for the entire corridor has not been identified. The problem with all these projects is inflation and in steel, asphalt, concrete is going up. Uh, but that's one that I know the community uh, has talked about it. I'm quite certain it'll be funded. Kootenai County voters said otherwise in 2020, voting against a $50 vehicle registration fee. The money would have helped fund 12 transportation projects, including widening I-90. I'm just not seeing this being the solutions um, that we really need in today. Transportation officials say an extra lane would save drivers time, increase traffic flow, and reduce crashes. I mean, we all know when we're sitting in traffic how frustrating it is, but it's also not safe. If you have like stop and go conditions, you have the opportunity for more crashes. Rogers believes an extra lane would result in more traffic and collisions. If everybody was like a train and stayed on their own tracks and was able to get down the road at the, the, the consistent speed, then this would be a perfect solution, but it's not. And that's not how people work. He wants the state to build an alternative east-west route to encourage drivers to get off the freeway sooner. We have a larger east-west problem here, and adding just one lane to I-90 doesn't solve that larger problem. One thing Rogers can agree on is that Idaho needs to start planning and building for the future now. A decade, two decades, three decades from now, what we do today will resonate. Thank you for joining us for this Krem 2 News Boomtown special on major projects across the inland northwest. I'm Tim Pham. And I'm Channing Curtis. With more people moving to the area, there's a need for new schools. Spokane recently opened two new middle schools with a third under construction right now. Amanda Rowley takes us to one of the new campuses for an inside look at Yasahara Middle School. Yasuhara Middle School was built with a focus on student relationships and that's why when you walk in you'll see the layout is unlike anything you've seen before. It's big and open with several spaces for students to gather. Down below is the learning commons where students can access it all throughout the day. This is another gathering space for students called the Learning Stairs. It can seat about 70 students, and if you look up above, it also features a pull-down projector screen, and it can be used for a variety of unique learning experiences. Relationships relate to success in school. And what we're looking for is building relationships, student to student, staff to student, and staff to staff. Instead of walking down hallways into separate classrooms, these classrooms are community-oriented and grouped together. Classrooms are grouped in neighborhoods, 
And these neighborhoods are clusters of teachers and students that will have co-collaboration co around curriculum, but also they'll have interaction throughout the day. The idea of inclusivity was even built into the school with an inviting semi-circle layout. Come take a look. Everything is wrapping around students. That's the structure of the building, but that's how our staff feel as well. How do we wrap around our students? How do we wrap around our community? How do we make sure that everybody believes that this is their neighborhood school? As the Inland Northwest grows, there is a need for more medical providers, and now they can get their training right here in Spokane. Nathan Hyun gives us a look at the Gonzaga University of Washington Medical School building. With a snip of the ribbon, an almost decade-long dream finally turned into reality. The building was made possible by a health partnership between Gonzaga and the University of Washington. This is just such a terrific day. It is the culmination of so much hard work on so many people. This was a dream. I remember when I first started my presidency, this was a dream. And it not only is a reality, it's a better reality than the dream. Students have already been using the 90,000 square feet building since mid-July. The building also has space for over 500 Gonzaga undergraduates in nursing and health sciences. I am so excited to be in the new building. Uh, our classes start in about two weeks for second years. Uh, we're excited to start in the new anatomy lab, um, also the new facilities. I've had some chances to be inside the rooms. Great study spaces, great uh, technological advancements as well. Some of the new features include an anatomy suite, high-tech research labs, and state-of-the-art classrooms. The building was also built eco-friendly. It utilizes an open-loop ground source heat pump to heat and cool the building. Students who get admitted into the Gonzaga Health Partnership Program are enrolled in the UW School of Medicine curriculum and complete their first 18 months of medical school. They then can stay in Spokane or move elsewhere for their clinicals. The associate dean hopes the new building enhances medical education in Spokane and brings more doctors to the area. The impact we want to have is, is to have our students come back here, serve our region here in the urban area in Spokane, but also we give them a great experience out in the rural, rural regions of eastern Washington. We want them to come back there and really provide that health care for those rural regions. Gonzaga is the first private institution to join the University of Washington School of Medicine as a full partner. The building was one of the main aspirations when the universities created their partnership in 2016. The city of Spokane is also in the process of remodeling its libraries. This past summer, the downtown branch reopened after two years of work. Malia Kamal shows us how the new look will help the library better serve our growing region. We've waited patiently for the revitalization of this library. A great library is what makes a great city. After two years of renovations, the downtown central Spokane Public Library is officially reopened. We uh, started this process way back in 2015 with pre-work um, with the citizens of Spokane really wondering what are they looking for in a library. So all of this is you know, citizen informed and voter informed. And then in 2018, we passed a bond, a $77 million bond that renovated four libraries and built three new libraries. And so this is one of those libraries. The library takes up an entire block. The features include a production studio for artists looking to record an album or put together a podcast. It has a 300-person capacity event hall, a play area for kids, a business lab that helps entrepreneurs start a new business, an archive area that holds 1,800 items of history, and so much more. Well, we just wanted to be a place where people come and can feel relaxed and have a good time and find um, different resources and, you know, having some food options. You can grab a cup of coffee, meet with, meet with a colleague, um, do some research. Community leaders say that the library will serve as a staple amongst the community. The library is always here for you, Spokane.
With more people moving to and visiting the Inland Northwest, Spokane International Airport is looking to expand. The effort recently got a boost from the FAA, who gave the airport $11 million for the project. This expansion will bring several changes to the airport, including additional gates to Terminal C, new security checkpoints to Terminals A and B, a new baggage claim area, expanding the existing ticketing area, and upgrades to the mechanical and HVAC systems. These upgrades will also increase the airport's capacity for new flights and nonstop destinations. Meantime, in Coeur d'Alene, plans are moving forward to build a new high-rise condo near the heart of downtown. The project, though, getting mixed reactions, some welcoming the growth, while others want the Lake City to stay the way it is. Kyle Simchuk has a look at the plans. This lot of dirt may not look like much now, but in two years, it'll be home to a 200-foot tower of condos across the street from McEwen Park and a stone's throw away from the Coeur d'Alene Resort. There's always a new building being built. There's always something changing. Lacey Moen would know. She grew up here and has owned Earthly Beauty Bar for 12 years. It's right next to where the high rise is going up. I'm not looking forward to the construction. You know, my building might shake. The building called the Thomas George will be about 17 feet shorter than the resort and will feature 60 luxury condos ranging in price from three quarters of a million to two million dollars. A realtor working with the developer tells Krem2 that roughly a third of the condos have already been reserved. The Thomas George will have several retail shops on the lower levels. Tenants have access to a 24 hour gym, virtual golf and an indoor outdoor pool. There's been a lot of talk about it. I have a very eclectic clientele. It goes from people who don't want to see Coeur d'Alene grow. It goes from people who think the more the merrier. I think at the end of the day, you cannot control a town. I think you just have to ride the wave. And um, if you love it, stay. If you don't, go. Others we spoke to off camera say they're worried about the tower blocking views of the lake. It's definitely hard for people to go through change and to watch things evolve. Moen thinks the new high rise will help her business, but she'd like to see more affordable options as well. Right now, we definitely have a need for um, housing that is not just affordable, but um, accessible. Thanks for joining us for this Creme 2 News Boomtown special on major projects in the Inland Northwest. I'm Tim Pham. And I'm Channing Curtis. Now, we have much more Boomtown coverage available for you to watch right now on Creme 2 Plus. To find it, just navigate to the News tab at the top of the screen. Then scroll down to our Boomtown playlist. If you don't yet have Creme 2 Plus, you can download it now for Roku and Amazon Fire. And be sure to keep it here on Creme 2 News for more Boomtown coverage. Thanks so much for watching.